MaximumFun.org. I never wanted to cover the media ever. Uh, I actually wanted to be an actress. I studied as an actress. Uh, I was working in a bar in Washington, D.C. that no longer exists on Columbia Road called Columbia Station in the late 70s when I realized I didn't have the intestinal fortitude to be an actor and a customer at the bar said, you want to write an article? I can get it for you. I mean, basically just wanted to, uh, you know, this was the 70s. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, he didn't realize he didn't really have to, but anyway, it was okay. So, um, so I wrote that article, and uh, you know, and then I started writing all kinds of weird things. It was a very slow, arduous trip through journalism. The first thing that I ever published were a couple of pamphlets for a group called Americans for Salt about the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. You know, is America hanging in the strategic balance? Uh, I said, maybe, and. Uh, <laughs> And then there was the, uh, the wonderful first actual staff job I had on the Trade Association magazine of the uh, strip mining industry, and I was fired from that. And uh, then I started working for Current, which was, is a public broadcasting newspaper. Uh, I quit that. I went to Cablevision. I went to a short-lived free weekly in Washington, had my kids, couldn't get a job for a year and a half. And then Scott Simon, who I'd met when I was covering uh, public broadcasting for Current, bumped into my husband, who was also a journalist, when Dizzy Gillespie was donating his trumpet at the Smithsonian, and said, what's Brooke doing? And that's how I ended up in public radio. So, <laughs> you know, and I share that because a lot of people ask me, how do you get into public radio? And I say, this is the way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so I started out as Scott's editor, then I became the editor of All Things Considered when I met my uh, evil twin nemesis and co-host Bob Garfield, <laughs> who was doing these kind of bizarro uh, Charles Kuralt kind of going around America doing features on people who, you know, freeze-dried their pets and things like that. And, I got a sense of humor, but you know we would have our tussles editorially, and uh, the most common question ever asked me about the program is, what does that pause that Jesse referred to before by Brooke means when he does the credits? And uh, I think that's really, you know, essentially uh, 22 years, I think started editing him in 89? Yeah, about 22 years of uh, dealing with me. and. Uh, <laughs> and all that that entails. So he likes it sometimes, and he doesn't like it other times, and he's a strong personality. And that's all I'll say on the subject of Bob, unless it comes up in the Q&A. <laughs> um, OK, so after a while, uh, I really wanted to, I loved editing, actually, but my husband, who uh, at the time was working for the Boston Globe, uh, was going to get a job at, uh, in the Moscow Bureau, and that was really exciting. So then I started freelancing for NPR as a Moscow correspondent. I did that for three years. When I came back, they gave me the media job because that was in New York, which is where we were moving. And that was the only job, and I was grateful to have it. But did I have a passion for the media? No. I'd covered the business. I'd covered cable. I'd covered public broadcasting. I'd covered the Congress when it, with regard to regulatory issues. I knew it. But, uh, you know, after Russia, what kind of a job is covering the media? I mean, it's all about perceptions and policies and trends and, you know, where's the meat? You know, where's the juice in that? You keep having to explain the stakes over and over again. You have to explain why it matters, why you should care. And you have to do it sort of implicitly, not just in the words, but also in the tone of your voice and the passion that you feel and the curiosity that you evince. And, you know, sincerity can be a very hard thing to fake. <laughs> so I forced myself to get interested, and that was fine. And then after six years, I couldn't do it anymore. And <clears throat> for two years, uh, the uh, guy who was in charge of programming at WNYC was trying to get me to take over this program uh, on the media, which was kind of a dead shark. It was stuck at 64 stations. There was a terrific host, but he was already doing 10 hours of live radio a week. There was a very dedicated but completely inexperienced staff that didn't know how to do a uh, national program. 
and uh, I didn't want to do it. And then he said, uh, what if I bring in Bob as co-host? And I went, sure. <laughs> and so, because I thought if I was stuck, I tried to get onto general assignment uh, at NPR, which was actually a demotion, but they wouldn't do it. And uh, so I thought, well, if I have to do media, then I'm gonna do it my own way. And that's what WNYC gave me the chance to do. So, but the funny thing is, is that after a while, People started tromping through the office and they wanted books, you know, because I have a selling platform, not because I necessarily had anything to say. And uh, they wanted a book about the media. I didn't want to do a book about the media. And then I'm not going to go into all the details about that, but I decided I did have enough to say after s 10 years of doing it uh, at, at the show and six years before that. And I wanted it to be a comic book, which brings me round to being an actress because this resulted, because of Norton's generosity, in the culmination of a life's dream, which is I got to be a comic book character. 1796, and it was a tea merchant named James Tilly Matthews who's convinced that evildoers are using a secret device to drive Britain to war with France. He screams out in Parliament, but he's stopped by something he calls the heirloom. The heirloom, he believes, is being operated by the new, then new science of gases. All influencing machines are operated by the newest science of the day. And he believed that it was planting an obsession about war in the minds of politicians and infecting his mind and his voice so he couldn't speak. He finally does yell, and he gets shipped off to Bedlam, where he stays for the rest of his life. He's an architect. He is a writer. He is altogether rational, except when he is thinking about the heirloom. He never budges from the notion that the heirloom is doing this to him and doing it to the world. And actually, he is the very first subject of a book-length treatise about a mental patient. Uh, that's how delightful he was. <laughs> but these are the same kinds of observations that people make about the media whenever a new technology rolls around. Check out this remark made by the editor of the Richmond Inquirer during the Civil War, 1863. He was saying it about the telegraph. Tell me if it sounds familiar. I mean, I hear that all the time about the internet, like that never existed before. It's always existed. The two constants are that people fear new communications technology and they always hate, the, hate reporters. <laughs> Especially the uh, literati, or anyone who's ever had to deal with a critic. And celebrities really, really hate them. <laughs> And presidents, even those infatuated by press freedom like Jefferson, hated them, and yet the public survives. He wrote that then because, <laughs> he wrote that because he was president. <laughs> um, in the mid 20th century, we have an aberration because before then, you had generally cheap technology, at least in the modern, relatively modern era. I'm talking about starting with, say, revolutionary times. You had relatively cheap technology. The American government, in its earliest days, subsidized the distribution of newspapers because they felt the need to forge a national identity, and they thought they couldn't unless they spread these newspapers around. That was the opposite of Europe that taxed newsprint very heavily uh, and censored it, which the US did not for at least six years until uh, <laughs> Adam signed the Seditions Act. But, uh, but in any case, so you had a fractured uh, tech, uh, technology that supported fragmented audiences and you had fragmented politics. And so you had an aesthetic of journalism that didn't condemn advocacy journalism, didn't see as some sort of highest art this myth known as objectivity. But, and then again, during the time of the penny press, you had the creation of these remarkable steam-driven 
uh, rotary presses that just flooded the street with newsprint. Suddenly, newspapers weren't owned by political parties anymore. They were, or guilds, they were just being fed for a penny to masses of workers and immigrants in the streets of New York and elsewhere. And again, fragmentation was the order of the day. It's really mid-century America, uh, mid-20th century America that is the aberration because you had suddenly the emergence of an incredibly expensive technology, one that needed audiences of unprecedented size to support the production of programs, which means you needed huge audiences to deliver the advertising that could pay for the programming. So fragmentation wasn't going to support television. Then you had an unbelievably consensus-driven politics. America faced an existential threat. We were facing the Cold War. Uh, it was in the public's interest to, it was in the government's interest, not the public's interest, but it was in the government's interest to create a kind of consensus politics that didn't allow for the voices of outliers that marginalized people on either side of the spectrum. This is uh, something I discovered along the way. This is the most famous quote about objectivity. It's the father of the New York Times who stated this as a general principle back in the, uh, l at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and that's generally where the quote ends. But if you go on and you read the rest of the quote, you will see that he had tons of political opinions. <laughs> so, um, and so once again, it isn't so much objectivity because that is impossible. I spend a lot of time uh, dealing with modern brain science in the book because how we process information has everything to do with how the media deliver information. Uh, the big point here is that the journalism of any era is the sum of technology plus politics. Uh, the golden age of journalism gave rise to it, uh, couldn't afford to alienate anybody, so it created a big middle. It was white, Christian, it had no accents, it had no vowels at the end of the last name. It gave birth to the kind of anchor that could end his newscast every night like this. <laughs> Astonishing arrogance when you think of it now. <laughs> I think we all know how complicated the world is. The world was very scary in Cronkite's heyday. Uh, and we found him reassuring. reassuring. We called him Uncle Wal Walter. He was in one poll voted most trusted man in America. Uh, that would not happen today with any news anchor, and I don't think that is any big loss. <laughs> we are now giving birth to our own media. It's completely democra democratized. We can filter the world according to any way we see fit, or we can evade those filters and create our own individual mainstream medias with all kinds of information streams that push us outside our comfort zones. Soon, all of this stuff is going to be implanted, if you listen to the propeller heads over at the uh, Pew Research Center. <laughs> and, uh, and the singularity will happen if Ray Kurzweil is right, and there will be no separation at all. This is, this is sort of uh, how I view the development of media from its earliest days and in the future. People know that we make tools. What we don't really realize is that tools make us. Anthropologists have determined that it isn't that man started walking on two feet and that really worked out well because he could pick up a club and kill his food. And that, uh, you know, his brains got bigger, his teeth got smaller, his fingers got more dexterous. All, you know, it started with bipedalism. That's not how it happened. Now the consensus among anthropologists is that somebody crawling along on all fours, like that first guy, picked up the club 
and he survived. And so people who people monkeys apes who walked on two feet could use a club better. So we bred ourselves because of our tool for bipedalism, and then the larger brains and everything else. The tool started that evolutionary process. The evolutionary process did not give rise to the tool. We are changing ourselves. Human beings, what it means to be human is constantly changing. Uh, you can choose to be scared by it, but I don't think I'm with uh, a group of scared people. I think you're all a bunch of science fiction geeks like me, or science fiction geek sympathizers, at least. <laughs> Douglas Adams once said that uh, any, any technology you grew up with is normal and right. And any technology that happens up until the age of 35 is uh, thrilling and fantastic, and you've got to use it and go into the future. And anything that happens after that is unnatural against the natural order of things and is going to bring the collapse of civilization. Well, you know, he said that in the very early 80s. Things are moving so quickly that I would push that to maybe after 45. But nevertheless, I think the principle still holds. Uh, you know, the media is like our senses. It's how we see the world, it's how we reflect it. Every cell phone camera, like a light flickering off a shard of that media mirror. There's a lot I say in the book about personal responsibility because I really do believe that we get the media we deserve. And now I'm happy to take questions. Yeah? So you um, talked a, a little bit about personalization and also about like marginalizing, you know, sort of the extremes of the culture. You hear kind of a lot of like blather about how now we're all going to live in our own little bubbles and we're never going to talk to people who don't agree with us. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you had any thoughts about like relating so to So many that. thoughts about that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, Cass Sunstein, who now works for uh, President Obama, uh, wrote a book called Republic 2.0 and a few others, and he gathers a lot of research that suggests the more you talk to people who are like yourself, uh, the more likely your views are to harden and grow more extreme. It's something he calls incestuous amplification. <laughs> a great phrase. And uh, it's true. So the question is, is, what does the new technology do to a natural human tendency for birds of a feather to flock together. This is called homophily. How do you defeat homophily? And how does the new media, how do the new media engender homophily? And so, you know, this is a big problem because you can go through and construct a world online in which you will never encounter a fact that you don't embrace or a view that d isn't completely in accordance with your worldview. But what the Pew Research Center found is that the more computer literate you are, the more likely you are to go down those rabbit holes where you come bumping against information that you don't normally encounter. Uh, the more likely you are to use social media, the more likely you are to have uh, to share photos with somebody of a different race and to have among your friends somebody of a different political party. Friends is a bad word for Facebook. There are plenty of reasons to hate Facebook, but, uh, <laughs> but the assembly of, of people uh, who, you know, who you know and who know you slightly or who you don't know but who are doing interesting things you might hear about is a very useful and interesting thing in terms of defeating the echo chamber. But I wish that they were called loose ties, which is what they are. Uh, they are loose ties. Loose ties, the looser the better because they're the ones who are going to expose you to stuff that your close ties are probably, like you, equally uninterested in. Uh, so. There's that. But then um, some of you are probably aware of Eli Pariser's new book, The Filter Bubble, which suggests that we are going to be defeated if we aren't very conscious of our behavior by the very structures that are there to serve us. Google now delivers different searches to different people based on their past behavior and past interests. Facebook 
will cease to send to your news feed people who you never express any curiosity about and never have contact with. Uh, Yahoo News, the New York Times will also tailor their searches to your past behavior. Eli Pariser, who is a creator of MoveOn.com, decided that for his Facebook he would friend lots of conservatives so he could see what they were doing. And, uh, and he found that gradually they disappeared off of his newsfeed, and this made him very indignant because he had friended them and he wanted to know. But the mysterious algorithm, the ghost in the Facebook machine, had determined that he really, by his behavior, had no interest in these people. So you have to sort of put your, you know, where your money, your money where your mouth is when it comes to seeking out views outside your comfort zone. Um, so I do believe that, you know, this is a tool like any other. It can allow us to hide and filter out the world or it can allow us to go forth and explore, uh, but we need to learn by our behavior to evade the barriers that are supposedly put there for our own enjoyment and our own protection. Uh -huh. How do you feel that the distribution of technology that lets people basically share information very easily affects that? So it's very easy for us to get, for example, camera shots from uh, the Arab Spring. Like, how does that interact with the sort of bubble that we're building? Um, well, I think that anything that brings you information from far away is uh, a rebuke to the filter bubble. I mean, if you can go around the filters and really access what's on the ground, that's great. Of course, there's always the problem of credibility. And there's always the problem of vetting. But that's, the pro that's a problem with mainstream media, too. I mean, it, it isn't always right. And, uh, and people of goodwill, people who are advocates, uh, who are you know, out there in Tahrir Square, uh, aren't interested in necessarily in propagating lies. There are you know, all sorts of people out there who, you know, who want to tell the truth just as well as any a uh, trained journalist is eager to tell the truth, and now you have somebody there who can. How do you vet those people? Those kinds of filters are emerging. They usually come up through our communities. Uh, the people, I talked to a lot of people when I was in Cairo not long ago, who were responsible for those feeds from Tahrir Square. And they knew who to trust and who not to trust. And, who, and they themselves gathered many, many followers who knew that their, their information was reliable. Didn't mean that some bad information didn't slip through now and again. It did. Uh, it's, a, it's very fast. Uh, but I think that when you can, you know, Skip, I mean, uh, here's, here's the other bubble. You know, the bubble of America being a kind of isolated, mysterious island nation that it is. And so very under-reporting of South America and <laughs> Africa and places that many people might have a reason to be interested in. Well, you know, we don't have to settle for the kind of reporting we get. We can get it from anywhere. What, if any, do you think is the role of the education system on talking with kids about media frameworks and their interaction with media? I, I, I think that there's a sort of obvious answer to your question is they ought to teach media literacy, right? But the less obvious observation is that generally the kids know more about how it works than they do. And uh, they also have a lot of built-in skepticism because they understand, you know, digital natives, those born, you know, before 1985 generally, that's, they're identified that way. They sort of move in that realm. They say that the consumers of the penny press were very savvy consumers. They bought lots of newspapers, sometimes several a day, but they knew that they couldn't necessarily believe everything they read. We were less savvy because of the golden age of objectivity, uh, mid-century till about, you know, 10 years ago, which, uh, mid-20th century till about 10 years ago, which gave rise to a class of ethical journalists who functioned with good values and, uh, but also only told us part of the story because it was a, a consensus kind of journalism. So, you know, the price of freedom is with uh, great information you'd otherwise never get is a bunch of junk, and I'm, wind, I'm wandering off your principal point. I, I think that people should be taught to think critically 
and that that's a sort of a, a general thing that isn't technology dependent. And if you learn how to ask a certain set of questions whenever confronting a bit of information, you don't really need to worry so much about here's what you need to do when you're looking at stuff on Wikipedia and here's what you need to do when you're getting stuff from Twitter and, and so on. I think it has to do with uh, knowing how we, there's a big chunk in the book about how humans are wired to think and it's terrifying how we are wired to resist information that is uh, contrary to decisions we've already made about the world. And so um, if we could understand how we think, we don't really need to teach them about the technology, which is moving so fast. Uh huh. I would kind of argue against the idea that digital natives are any more, uh, you know, they, they understand the source of the electronic media better than the most like kind of But they're just as gullible? Yeah, I think they're, 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 they're I mean, Australia to a digital native, but I see these people who are, you know, five years younger than me, and they, they're, they're you know, gorging themselves on the sweets of the internet, the funny videos that, that, that you know, what's thrown at them, they, the, you know, they, they're not left like me where I, I, I see a topic and I just do a lot of research on it because it interests me. They're like, oh, I'll just, you know, skim Wikipedia, write my paper, and I'm Yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, people who are just not going to be that curious. I'm not saying that digital natives are smarter or better than you know, people who are older. What I'm saying is that the same kind of om information omnivores who would be less critical because they're older and are used to a reliable mainstream media, those same kind of people th who have the same impulses to consume information know how to apply different criteria to the information that comes through you know, online sources. I'm just saying that they are used to dealing in that sphere. I am not saying that uh, there's a higher percentage of young people who care about information and know how to research and vet than, uh, than older people. And also the 1985 thing is very rough. But, I'm, I, was just, uh, but I was just saying that you know, find person A who cares about information, is an omnivore and is curious, and person B, uh, person A, who may be 45, may not know how to view stuff that comes in through their email. You know, should I believe? I mean, I get lots of, especially a couple of years ago, because everybody's getting a lot more used to it, a, a big part of my job for my family was to get a picture and have, then they would say, is this real? You know, is Bush really reading that book upside down? Are they really in that canoe in the middle of the streets of New Orleans fishing after Katrina? Uh, is Sarah Palin really wearing a bikini, packing a pistol by the pool? You know, uh, you know, and it's because they just aren't aware of the sort of photoshopification of our culture. That's really all I meant. Um, yes. Um, you mentioned the myth of objectivity. And what I love about on the media is that there's a distinct voice. Uh, one of my favorite moments in radio this year so far has been um, during the discussion of the bias in NPR coverage. The skepticism you had in your voice when you were talking with a conservative news analyst who mm -hmm. was stating that just asking a question was showing mm -hmm. bias. Mm -hmm. uh, could you discuss like the development of that tone on the show? <laughs> <laughs> um, development of that tone. Well, you know, I think it's just basically my tone. I mean, uh, you know, I, uh, I remember when Ira Glass went on Stephen Colbert, and Stephen Colbert said, I, I love how you, you know, distill all the humanity out of your voice. And, <laughs> and, and, the, and then, he, then he did an imitation of, uh, of Ira. He, he went, uh, hello, this is Ira Glass. This is American Life. <laughs> Today's subject, dogs. <laughs> and, and, uh, and what Ira said is, it's just the way I talk. And you know, if you've talked to Ira, you know that it's the way he talks. Uh, he actually gets more excited than, than that little cadence that he does at the beginning of the show, but you know, it's fundamentally the way he talks. Uh, I think that the, the function of the tone is just 10 years of being in my own little sandbox. Uh, you get really comfortable, and then you just, you know, it's a very safe place, uh, a recording studio. I don't know if you've ever been in one, but I know some people like uh, you know, going into those sort of 
sensory deprivation tanks. I mean, to me, that would be way too claustrophobic. But there is nothing nicer than sitting in a booth, the lights are low, and looking out at you are the engineer and the producer. You really like them, and you know, and it's you don't. You're just there by yourself, and that's the weird thing is because the. Uh, that intimacy that you feel in that space is directly translated to all the listeners, right? Which is what makes radio so different from any other medium. That illusion of a one-to-one -one relationship. You don't get it with TV. And, you know, print by convention, the writer is pretty much absent when reporting the news. But the radio, you're dependent on somebody's voice. And a voice is really, really personal. Uh, just going off... Uh, this topic for one second. Uh, a lot of people have asked me, why did I make a comic book instead of a regular book? And it was because it was the most I could get, the closest I could get to radio. Which seems weird because, you know, radio doesn't have pictures. But here's the thing, is that I can talk in bubbles and I can look the reader in the eye and I can build my argument instead of with sound, which is sticky, with images that are sticky. And I can connect. Another thing is that comic books have a rhythm. They have a very definite rhythm. And radio has a rhythm you can play with with editing. And it is also, uh, and a lot of those rules translate so easily. And, and that, was, that was amazing. Coming up with all a thousand images, that was hard for me. But the, uh, but the rhythm part of it was easy. It felt really natural. And, uh, you know, I'm really kind of hooked on that. So I guess the tone is, is that you start learning how to connect in a personal way, and then you don't get that sort of generalized, I am talking to a million people tone that you get from television. And, uh, and that I, when I started out in radio, I had. I mean, I used to have this, I would raise my soft palate because I hate my nasality. And I'd say, you know, when I would fill in for Scott, you know, from WNYC in Washington, this is On the Media. Scott si no, this is uh, Weekend Edition. Scott Simon is out this week. I'm Brooke Gladstone, and my, my soft palate is lifted, and I don't sound so nasal. And I did that as a reporter. And when I got really mad at my kids, I'd say, Sophie, come down here. And she said, I'm not if you're going to be using your radio voice. I am not coming down. <laughs> and uh, she never... You know, well, she's, they're grown now, but, you know, even now, if I get annoyed at them, they never accuse me of the radio voice. It's a, so I guess I just got comfortable. That's where the tone came from. Uh-huh. Uh, you, you, know, you talked a lot about uh, the, the sort of media criticism today. What, what are you excited the most about in media that's here now or, or you think is just around the corner? What, what, what's the most exciting thing to you? Well, Anything new fills me with both excitement and profound anxiety. Not because I'm afraid of what it's going to do to the culture. I'm not afraid of that at all. I like chaos. But I have to, I ha I have to cover it, and that's hard. <laughs> so I like to look way ahead. And I'm really looking forward to the time when I don't have to deal with devices. That I, that, I mean, I really believe that there is going to be... Uh, implants at some point. I mean, Intel said uh, that they were going to be able to, you know, really put Intel inside by 2020. <laughs> I don't believe that, but, you know, I like the idea that we will be able to just sort of float into a sea of information with like-minded people. Uh, the big problem now, and this is going back to the echo chamber question, is how do you engineer those accidental encounters? There are people working on this problem. In computer speak, everybody probably already knows this phrase. It's called serendipity, the encounter with accidental information. How do you engineer serendipity when there is so much that is uh, working against that? Human nature being first of all. And uh, I'm really, if I'm excited about anything, it's about how they deal with that problem, because I think they will deal with it. I want to be able to encounter accidental information, uh, and I want to see how they figure that out, because right now it's moving in the other direction, but I don't think it's going to stay that way. Anybody been waiting a real hand? Somebody with the Last one. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to phrase this question, but I, I think I'd like to hear you uh, 
uh, talk about John Stewart and Stephen Colbert. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, I mean, yeah. No, I mean, a lot of people have said that uh, you know those guys are kind of the uh, truth tellers of the digital age. It's an age uh, that isn't civil. It's an age that isn't polite. Uh, it's an age of screaming and yelling. You know, in a way, they sort of demonstrate, although both of them are entirely capable and have on many occasions taken things wildly out of context and uh, misrepresented people's remarks for the sake of a joke. And it's a little worrisome because they are so influential and they are so funny and they are so wise and so smart and such brilliant analysts most of the time. And I think less and less, I think John Stewart is uh, backing off this notion of, you know, exculpation. You know, I'm just a comedian. It doesn't matter. I think he understands. I think that uh, uh, the march for sanity and or demonstration for sanity and or fear indicated that uh, they understand that they have a real role that they're playing in the culture, and it's one that's very much in sync with this new age of fragmentation and, and advocacy. I think they demonstrate to a large extent that it is impossible, that it is entirely possible to be an advocate and to still be fair and to deal honestly with information, uh, which they frequently do. I just wish it weren't so spotty because, you know, you have to sort of, but it's always funny. And so it does make you care. And that's important. I think that caring is number one. He makes you care. He, he, when he's dealing with really important issues, he almost always gets it right. It's just when people say embarrassing things and stuff, he doesn't always put the context in. Uh, so the joke stuff, you know, don't consider it facts and, you, and you're okay. Apply your skepticism. These guys augur what the next... Uh, generation of information is going to be like. Uh, a lot of people, when we started out, and I, uh, and I say this uh, with profound humility, used to compare us to The Daily Show, not because we were funny, but because back when we started out, everything was so tight that we seemed so loose in comparison. I think that that uh, uh, equation with The Daily Show and uh, is, is, in fact, this was even before Colbert. That's how far back it goes. Uh, the media, the tone of the media in general has changed so radically that I don't think, you know, people would say that. But they did at the beginning, and it was simply just that we believed that disclosure and transparency are the new objectivity. Explain. You don't even have to explain. Show how you feel then people can take that into account. Just like a movie reviewer, you know, they're always going to hate a movie by this kind of person, so you won't trust them on this, but you'll trust them on other things. Just let them get to know you. They know who you are. They know what your biases are. They'll take things on the topic where you disagree with that person with a grain of salt, and there is honesty. That's better than objectivity, which, mean, which really boils down to trust me. And I'll take my stuff with me. I'll do it after. Um, well, I, I want to thank I want to thank Brooke for joining us. And Brooke, before you escape to the comfort of the audience, I want to take this opportunity to give you our second uh, special citation in the area of broadcasting for contributions to things that are awesome. So. Brooke Gladstone from On The Media. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Brooke. Um.